Finally, we need to address one last issue. Some will say that if it's not copied from the Bible, maybe it was copied from different religious books that were available in this time period. Let's take a look at some of the available knowledge back then. If you read the Atharva Veda 4.11.1, you will find that there is a big ball holding up the earth. If you read the Atharva Veda 6.44.3, you will find that God drinks urine. If you read Rig Veda 1.58, you will find that the sun is driving a two-wheeled, horse-drawn vehicle and getting pulled by seven horses. This is why the sun is moving. And what about the hundreds of scientific facts written in the Quran? How did Muhammad know all that? Maybe he talked to the best scientists of his era, right? Maybe Aristotle? Aristotle thought that the brain was a radiator. The blood flows inside it to cool down, which kept all important heart from overheating. Aristotle believed that men have more teeth than women. Even though he was married, he must never have counted. Aristotle thought that worms grow to be snakes. Aristotle thought that semen converts period blood into solid, like converting milk into cheese. This is how new life begins. Aristotle thought that the upper part of the fetus is created first, then the lower part. Then Muhammad didn't copy from Aristotle. Maybe Galen? Galen said that there is a dwarf embryo in the male sperm which is nourished by the female semen until it grows to be a fetus. Galen said that the semen is white blood. Galen and Hippocrates strongly believed that the right testicle made the boy sperm and the left testicle made the girl sperm. As early as 330 BC, Aristotle prescribed dying off the left testicle in men wishing to have boys. Until the French Revolution, men were making surgeries to remove the left testicle because it was believed that the right testicle produced boys and the left one produced girls. Hippocrates thought that babies are created from heat, and the woman's womb is like an oven that heats the baby to create its bones. That is why the Quran describes the stages of creation of the human fetus from sperm to baby exactly as if it was written next to a modern fetal ultrasonic machine. They attach to the epithelial cells lining the oviduct where they stay and can quickly detach and move when ovulation gets closer. In short, they can stay attached in the woman for a couple of days at least before she ovulates, detach and move closer to the egg when ovulation does occur and then attach again to the egg. It's an uphill battle all the way until one strong and determined sperm manages to attach itself to the egg. Within seconds, the sperm is engulfed by the egg. This is a process called phagocytosis by scientists, meaning that the sperm is ingested or engulfed by the egg. After this happens, the sperm's nuclear envelope disintegrates and the sperm and egg become a one-cell embryo, as reported by Story in 1995 and Evans in 2001 respectively. When you think about all that, it's hard not to admit that embryology is truly a miraculous process. And just as miraculous as the process itself is the fact that the Quran, a book revealed in the 6th century, described this intricate process so accurately all those years ago. How did the author of the Quran know? Do you still think Muhammad copied from science books? Tales of Miletus said that the originating principle of nature was a single material substance, water. All Chinese culture thought that human joints are 365, like the number of days in the year. And this was corrected by Prophet Muhammad to exactly 360 joints 1400 years ago, and then by Nature magazine in 2020 to be exactly 360 joints. Sorry, Nature Magazine, you are 1400 years late to this discovery. All of these religious and scientific mistakes were first corrected by the illiterate Muhammad in the middle of the desert 1400 years ago, and again these days using modern technology. Miracles are not part of historical legends. You have your own miracle right now. You just refuse to read it because they told you not to read it on television. Quran breaks the logical expectations and breaks the boundaries of what is possible for a man by having a lot of information that in no way can be written in it unless it is from the one who created knowledge. The one who created everything. 
We provided more than 50 examples for you in our playlist Real Miracles in the 21st Century. Link is in the description and first comment. People reject Islam because it's from the Middle East. People think that Islam is the religion of the Middle East and Christianity is the religion of Europe. Actually, Christianity is from the Middle East too. Jesus was from the Middle East. Even Paul, who said you don't have to follow the laws like Jesus anymore, and who claimed to talk to God, was from Turkey, and claimed to talk to God in Syria. It's not about nationalism. It's not about us versus them. It's about what is the truth. And if you're taking your religion from the Middle East anyway, at least take the correct one. If you consider for one moment, just one second, that there is an Akhirah, yeah? You don't believe in it, but what if you're wrong? If you consider that for one second that you are wrong, is it not better to take uh, precaution, like when you wear your seatbelt? Take precaution, give religion a moment. And I'm not talking about uh, religion of different hotspots beliefs and rituals, I'm talking about Islam. Give the Quran time, read it. If after you read it, you disbelieve in it, then that's up to you. But if you, want, if you do read it and something changes in your life like it did for me, then it's only going to be for the better. Even in modern days, some theories are still jokes. We debunked the whole evolution theory with scientific proof in our video titled Capitalism Failed to Fuel Evolution. Nice try. Link is also in the description and first comment. They say if you want to become an atheist, you should read the Bible. That is correct because the truth is not an option. You either believe in an illogical book filled with mistakes and contradictions or believe that the universe created itself and we all came to life by random chance. Actually, being a result of random mutations makes more sense than the Bible. But they are forgetting the third option. The only logical, bulletproof option. The miracle Quran. If you deny the truth without even seeing it, you are left to choose between two lies. Don't fall into this trap. They will tell you, do you believe in science or do you believe in God? Yes, without Quran, you have to choose one of them because Bible has a lot of scientific mistakes. But with the Quran, you can believe in both science and God. Because, of course, when I started writing the book, a lot of people think that it was a political book. But it wasn't so much a political book, it was a religious book because I wanted to show people why Islam was a danger as a religion. And I wrote it from a Christian perspective. So in the beginning, I made a comparison between the Christian concept of God and the Islamic concept. So I started comparing it. But because I had these doubts about the Trinity and I saw Tawhid, eh, the oneness of God in Islam, I thought, yeah, that sounds a little bit more logical. And then I thought to myself, well, I reread the Bible to see, to refresh myself. To see, okay, why isn't the concept of Islam, the Tawhid concept, isn't the Christian concept? But when I was reading the Old Testament and I saw what the Old Testament prophets said, it was one God, one God, one God. And then I thought, okay, I'll look only at the words of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And then there's this story in the New Testament there where a guy comes to Jesus and he asks him, what is the most important thing in life? How can I gain paradise? And he said, there are two things. He says, here, O Israel, here your God is one. Treat your neighbor as you want to be treated yourself. So I thought, well, even Jesus Christ says, here, O Israel, your God is one. So I thought, well, this whole Muslim concept of God sounds more logical, and it's the same concept that I find in the Old and the New Testament. And I know Christianity as a religion teaches something else, but it isn't the concept of God that I find in the Bible. I was writing an anti-Islam book with an anti-Islam purpose, and I'm asking this Muslim professor from another country, can you help me? <laughs> So I told him, I'm writing a book. I have a lot of questions. So I, I was very plain why I thought, why is Islam promoting terrorism? Why is anti-woman? Why is anti-Christian, anti-whatever? I read all these books and articles and made com a comparison between prophets from the Old Testament with Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. I had no arguments anymore to say they are prophets and he is not. And I thought to myself, well, if I accept Moses on these grounds and I cannot accept the prophet, then there is something else. So I said, why don't I think he is a prophet? And I thought, oh, perhaps because he had many wives. But then again, when you look at Solomon or you look at King David, Abraham, there are a lot of people in the Old Testament that had more.
more wives. And when you look at even outside of the religious books, culturally in Europe, in, in Africa, Asia, everywhere, there were men with several wives uh, for several reasons. So I thought to myself, well, that cannot be a reason either. So one by one, all these reasons fell. And in the end, I thought, well, I have to say all of them are not prophets, but I, I didn't believe that because I thought, well, the things they did, they said, the miracles that happened, etc., they were confirmed in what they said and what they did. So they are. And then I said, well, then I have to accept that Prophet Muhammad perhaps is a prophet too. So I was doubting it. So first I thought, well, it's the most evil person I know because of the history. Then I said, well, perhaps it's not that evil, but he's not a prophet. And in the end, I start doubting perhaps he is a prophet. Yeah, that took, of course, me reading a lot of books again. And the one thing that I think was very wise of Abdul Hakim Murad to say was, he said, well, the books you read about with the anti-Islam arguments are written by non-Muslims. He said, if you want to know more about Christianity, you don't read books from atheists. You start reading the books from the Christians. Why do they believe this? What are the arguments? So he said, you have to do the same with Islam. So start reading Islamic books from Islamic teachers, from Islamic scholars, etc. And then you can see if you compare the books on the same topic of people who are Muslim and wrote those books and non-Muslim, you can see where they took the wrong turn, where they translated words in the wrong way, sometimes perhaps even not on purpose, but just because they didn't know where things are added, where things left out of it. When I thought that, I thought, well, I have these arguments for him being a prophet. I see his character. I see the way he treated other people. I see how he treated his enemies. I think he is a prophet. But then I thought to myself, whoa, that's horrible because I already accepted this oneness of God. And now I say he is a prophet. If I say there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet, it's almost Shahada. So I thought to myself, okay, let's close the books. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> this is going in the wrong direction. And of course, I wasn't that anti-Islam anymore because of what I read, what I saw and what I experienced. What I tell you now, it sounds a little like a fairy tale, but it really happened. In the end, there were all these books at the table. And when I had this feeling of, yeah, hey, this is Shahada in a way, I thought, well, I put all the books away and I put uh, the books on the highest shelf. But there were so many books that a lot of books fell off the shelf. And one of the books that fell off the shelf was the Quran. And when I picked it up, my hand was on a page with Surah 22, Ayat 46. And it says, it's not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts. And I thought to myself, that really is my problem because it wasn't the eyes. I, I really could see what I written down myself. Nobody forced me to write this book. Nobody said you have to write this or that. I started writing myself and I could see it with my own eyes, but I still couldn't accept the fact that I said he is a prophet. There is this one God. I just couldn't. So it wasn't my eyes that were blind. It was really my heart. I couldn't accept it. I think my nafs or my nafs or whatever, my ego, I, I couldn't accept it. And I said, well, God, I don't care if it's the God from the Bible or the Quran, give me a sign or something so that I 100% and sure, no, this is the way. And I went to bed, but when I woke up, I felt very secure in myself. I really feel very secure. I, I've never been more secure about anything else. The whole anxiety or the whole doubting issue disappeared like, like snow for the sun. And I thought to myself, well, I think I'm a Muslim.